Wrong one. Wrong one. That's okay. We got it. Good morning and <clears throat> welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar show where we cover a variety of topics that might be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as every week as we are doing right now, and it will be posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. And this is uh, similar to your uh, state library. Uh, and uh, so we provide services to all types of libraries. Uh, so you will find um, shows um, on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, our, really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, uh, something cool libraries are doing. We bring guest speakers to share what they're doing, um, services and programs we think they could, that libraries could benefit from. We do book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, could be anything. Um, as I said, we do we can we bring in guest speakers sometimes, uh, but sometimes we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations for us today. And um, today is a special day. Um, we're starting something new, uh, a new four-part series today on teaching technology in the library, with Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. Yeah, and we're going to find out today who is learning and why. It's true. <laughs> so I will uh, hand it over to you, Amanda, to tell us all about it. Well, so first I'll dig into kind of what we're going to go over here, because this is actually a completely new series. I'm trying something very new here. Mm -hmm. and I'm very excited about it. I hope you are. <laughs> <laughs> and... So what this is all about is one of the major questions that I've gotten is how does instruction actually evolve? What does it look like through the stages and how can I start learning this process so I can try it myself? So what I'm trying now in the teaching tech series is to kind of poke through what's under the hood of putting together one of these courses and trying to figure out what people need and figure out how to put it out there. So a lot of times people are kind of tempted to wait until everything looks perfect before it just goes out into the world. But as it turns out, that's not really recommended anymore. Um, what's recommended is to kind of use like a rapid iteration process so that you start just getting the idea together and start putting it in front of people as soon as you possibly can. So if you do go over to that link that I sent over for the teaching tech series, it's not going to look perfect. Nothing is ever perfect. But the purpose, like the whole purpose of this is to test the idea. It's to put it out there, get the feedback, and fix it as you go along. So I'll start off with going over what the teaching tech course is actually all about. And then I'll go over some of the iteration and design process. We'll talk a little bit about user experience design. And the bulk of this is going to be digging into some of these techniques, which might be why some of you are here. And so this is actually what's going to be in the course. This is what you are learning. This is the subject matter content, the who is learning and why. And the user experience design is just tied into it. User experience is basically how can we build a product that fits into the flow of people's everyday life. And when you think about it, um, any library service, it's a product. If you, if you do like um, a book discussion group or a knitting club, or if you do a code club, robotics club, you are actually designing a product. It's something that is made available to people 
and you're supposed to be choosing a time of day that works for people. You want to choose content that works for people. And you want to make sure that the content that you're covering is relevant to people's everyday life. And that is the heart of user experience design is I want to be able to offer this new technology course. I want to be able to offer this new library service. But how does this fit into people's lives? Is this working into the flow of people's everyday life? Is it, how is this working? Mm -hmm. So that is why we touch on that user experience design. Some of you may have already, some of you may already use it already. Some of you might be new to it. And it's kind of, I'll cover some stuff you might know, some stuff that's new. So let's just start at the top here. The, what is the teaching tech course? So the teaching tech course is basically designing a library service. It's designing the products in the library that people are actually going to see. So there is a kind of a general process to designing that product. And so some of this process you might already do in other ways, but we're going to take a user experience approach to it. So everything that I'm talking about now is going to come from the perspective of user experience design and product design. And I'll also be using some startup principles. So startups are really good at rapid iteration and design. And they are really good at testing things out and not putting too much into an idea until you actually know that it works. And since libraries have really limited time, resources, and energy to put into all this stuff, those startup processes have actually been incredibly helpful so far. Because why would you put all the time, energy, and money into something that's just going to flop? So that's why we start off with who is learning and why. The who is learning and why section of this designing a product for the library is finding out what makes people tick. What are the problems people are facing? What matters to them? And if you're going to design a product or service that is going to fit into the flow of people's everyday life, you need to know what people's everyday life looks like. And you need to know what matters to people. The bigger the problem people are facing, the more likely they are to take action to solve it. And when you design a product that flows into a person's schedule and you develop resources that people can use in the moment and you understand how people are learning this stuff versus how people are using it in everyday life, then that is kind of the heart of figuring out who's learning and why. And you would just want to know, why should people care? If you're going to teach a robotics class or you're going to teach um, a Microsoft Office class, or a Microsoft Excel class, why? What's the purpose of it? And a lot of times we start off with Googling a top 10 list of the most popular technology and then trying to design a service around that just because it's popular. But that's not always the way that it should go. Instead, you want to start with the problems people are facing and only offer the technology that fits into solving that problem. So if you've ever done a, an event or, or hosted a class that no one attended, that could be why. And it could also be the marketing of the course. Did you actually draw from the reasons people would actually be going there or did you just say, here's Excel, do it. And so then the later series of, the, of this course we'll be digging into breaking down the problems that people are facing step by step and saying, okay, we found out that older adults that are recently retired, they're now looking for the next stage in life. We want to know what they're facing right now. They're trying to figure out retirement. They're trying to fill their lives with other hobbies, and they also want to stay connected with their friends and family. So now we want to know what their actual day looks like, what they're facing, how much time they have, when they're actually free during the day. And then you pluck out one of the major, major problems that, they, that that group is facing 
and shift over to this next phase where you break that problem down into smaller subtopics and say, this is the entire process that people are facing right now. These are the smaller problems people are facing. This is the, these are the areas where the library can actually help. These are the other organizations within the community that are working on finding a solution. And these are, this is where the library can route people to help solve this problem. And this is how we can help with these particular aspects. So, and that's going to vary a lot depending on the actual problem we are working on. Some of it's gonna be easy. Some of it can be solved with just an infographic that's sitting next to the computer lab in the library. But other things might need to have a much more complex solution that works with other partners within the community. And that's what we dig into in that next section there. And the third section of it is, okay, we know who's learning, we know what they're facing, but people still aren't showing up. Are there other ways that we can be doing this? Are there other ways that we can teach this stuff? So some of the common things that libraries do is to do the TED Talk style events, there's workshops, there's trainings, there's group trainings, reference interviews. There's just a mess of stuff that we already do. So how do we choose the best option from the menu that's currently available or how do we create a new option based on the new needs that people are facing? So we'll look at some different ways that instructional design has been happening, some new ways that people have been teaching both online, in person, and in a hybrid format. Um, I dig into a lot in instructional design and technology because technology is a thing. And then once we have kind of a choice of what, how we actually want to teach this, then we'll start gathering resources and securing down partners within the community that might be able to help with this. And sometimes for some stuff, you don't even need a partner, you can just go do it. But for the more complicated stuff like job searches or um, career changes or career exploration, things like that, you probably need a partner for. So you can map out the different organizations and you'll actually continue this process iteratively as you go along because you might also choose a problem to focus on based on who's available to help. And you might also start returning back to this stage once you've brought on a partner who knows more about the topic. When you brought on the partner that knows more, you circle back and start adjusting the previous phase. And so once you've started gathering the resources, then you'd need to figure out, okay, so we just decided to enter in a new space where we're gonna be teaching some of this stuff. So how do we prepare staff to do it? How do we help our library staff volunteers or advocates deal with this new material? What do we already know? What do we need to learn? And when are we going to learn it? And then how are we going to maintain accountability and stay on track during this whole process. So that is the preparing staff and material section. And then the last little bit of this is the marketing and follow-up. So if you, if you circle back, remember this is iterative, you wanna circle back to the who is learning and why. If you are marketing a class on Excel, what kind of images are you going to use to pull people in? Is it going to be a computer? Is it going to be an image of a financial services office because you're going to be using Excel to build a budget for a savings plan so you can go on vacation? Um, how are you going to, where are people in their everyday life so that you can connect people with the information they need? And how are they gonna find you? When you understand where people are and meet them where they're at, then you can choose the best marketing route to be able to connect to them. And then you can start learning the tools and resources that you need to improve that marketing technique. And this marketing is also in the user experience and interaction phase. So they use that a lot in startups. Um, startups and libraries have a lot in common as it turns out. And so some of the same techniques that I pulled from startups and local businesses, you can use in the library too. Startups love free things and so do libraries. They get along. And the follow-up part of this is 
how do you find out whether you, this new service that you, this new product that you designed for the library, how do you find out it worked? And how do you gather the data and gather the stories, gather the information to show that this is a thing that you should be doing more of, or this is a thing that needs to be adjusted and how? And, or is this just something that didn't work? Should we just scrap it and start over with a different thing? So that is kind of the major steps of actually teaching technology in the library. You might get through all six, six of these steps in less than a day or a week, and you might take maybe a month or a few months to work through this, depending on how complex the problem you are facing. All right. So our main focus in this, this is a lot. I understand that. I've been told that. I mm -hmm. get it. <laughs> you know? Which is why we split it up into multiple sessions. And yep. you know? don't, you're not going to learn all of this in the next hour. <laughs> no, not at all. No. So don't panic. And so we are living right here. The who is learning and why. This first stage right here. So. To understand who's learning and why, I dug a lot into that iterative design and how to grow your idea over time. So these are two of the books that helped me a lot in learning it. So instead of me watering down and talking about a lot of these topics, I'll just send you directly to the source. Um, try out design for how people learn. Um, this was kind of an awesome resource for learning how to play off of white space, learning how to organize materials and resources, and learning how to work with both small and large teams to make this happen. Because each different library in every different community is structured differently, and they have a different number of people that are allocated to work on these projects. Some people might have a team of one, it might be just you, and some people might have a team of five, six or more. It depends on size of library and how much you are devoting resources to this project right now. And the design thinking playbook has been invaluable. Um, even the format of these pages are different than your average book. It uses a lot of full color imagery, plays on white space. You can learn a lot from design just by looking at how they design this book. And it's playful, catches the attention, and it also shows how products evolve over time and everything you design in the library can be seen as a product as I found out and even though this is sometimes geared toward businesses a lot of it crosses over it's a product is a product is a product so these are some others that I found really helpful if you are looking for the source material um, I pulled a lot of the basics from some of these resources, and there's also a variety of other resources I grabbed from. My main goal is in designing the course was so that you didn't actually have to read through word by word all the different stuff that I had already read. Um, I plucked out the stuff that you actually need in the moment and started baking it into the actual course. So you don't have to read this, but if you do want to, if you want to know where I got it from, or if you want to learn more about it yourself, these are the places that I went. And along with about 20, 30 other books, just over time, it took a minute, but there, it, there's about a billion and one resources. Um, the user experience team of one is incredibly helpful if you're a solo librarian or if you are the only one in your department working on this stuff. And this, how yeah. Did, yeah. It's very important to many of our <laughs> libraries. Yeah. And these, are, these two on the right are good if you are getting into teaching online. So teaching online is a different animal. And so if you are used to doing in-person stuff and only in-person stuff, recently that hasn't been an option. And now that it hasn't been an option and people are getting used to the idea of everything being available online, this is now a space where libraries need to live. And so you may have already started shifting over and said, we tried online, it doesn't work, we're going back to in-person. 
but a lot of that can be just the style that you were using. And it could have been the activities that you chose, and it could have just been that it didn't fit into people's everyday life. So instead of just calling online a wash, maybe try something different and start thinking about the design process and how it fits with people. All right, so if you want to learn other things about user experience design, I have these embedded into the course itself, but they're also available in the slideshow if you want a quick access. Um, these, this is one of the best books that I found about designing products, and I pull a lot from it. And Nir Eyal, he's out of Stanford, he's delightful. Um, I went to a few talks from him, and he's just awesome. And this is, a, this is just another list. You can grab it, read through it as you, as you like. Some of these resources are baked in, but I put them into the slideshow just for easy access, just because I haven't mm -hmm. completely finished updating every little nuance of the course. And we'll I'll mention too, while you're seeing all these links, that at, um, as part of the archive, you're gonna you'll have access to all of the of Amanda's slides too. So yep. um, don't worry about trying to scribble down these titles, these names of these places, or anything. Worry about worry about what the link actually is. You'll have a link to these Google slides, and you'll be able to click right on them. Okay, I will actually them. just share it now, yeah. just in case. Copy. And I will put this into the chat if anyone is curious about it. Yeah. And, there we go. So that is the slides. And so now we'll actually dig into the course itself. So this is the course page of what you would actually be looking at. So if you remember, I said that when you put out an idea, try to put out the concept as soon as you possibly can, instead of waiting till everything looks perfect and putting all of your time, effort, and energy into making it look awesome. So you can see that this is primarily, it's text on a page, and it's sectioned out just by regular category. You've probably seen this on about 8 million and one different websites and pages but then this is what it starts to look like over time what i'm doing right now and this is kind of the looking under the hood process of putting together a course is i'm putting the idea out there and making sure that this concept model actually works so i've already done about four workshops that run through this different process and as people learned and understood the general process, I found out the different aspects of this process people are most likely to use. And then I found out, and remember, I'm using user, I'm designing within design. It's kind of trippy, but it works. Because I'm designing the resources that are going to be used by library staff. Library staff are designing the resources that are going to be made by patrons. So I have to understand the process that patrons would need, but then I also need to know how library staff are going to learn this so that they can extend it to patrons. So it's kind of design baked within design. So the workshops were with library staff. As library staff start using this model to go out into the world, and as I start using the same model and other things that I do, and as I reach out to actual patrons and maker spaces and things like that, this idea evolves. But the whole purpose of this was to put it out there. And now that people started understanding these stages, I started, I can iterate now. And I can start figuring out the progression of how this should actually ad change, adapt, and I can grow resources that people can use in the flow of everyday library life. So what I started doing was bucketing out the different categories of users within library land. And within that, I started bucketing out the categories of users that are within the community itself because they're different. 
And so that's something that I have to worry about, but most of you probably don't. A lot of you probably just need to think about one layer of this, which is how do I connect this over to patrons? How do I help patrons connect with this information? So the good thing is that you don't actually have to always worry about that other layer unless you're working for a state or a regional library. Some of you might, but you might be in luck. And so the who is learning and why, I'll click that open here. And I'll start talking about the methods that you can actually use and what might be most relevant for you. So of course you can click open this link and just start reading it. You might have actually already done that. So I'm going to copy this link in for people who haven't already accessed it. And teaching tech course link. There. So I'll talk you through how some of this came about, give you some design tips, and start talking about the different methods that have worked, what hasn't worked, and what you might want to try based on the context of your library. And so if you, if you sift through this top section, it's going to talk about why this stuff matters and sort of what, you, what people have run into when they've skipped this step. Everyone, wa everyone wants to go straight to, we are teaching people robotics, but they skip why. And they skip over what are people going to use this tool with in the in their actual lives? How does this fit? There's so, so many cool buzzwords out there right now and things that grab people's attention. Yeah. But if you skip so, the the why, you're 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 just show yeah. them something cool and fun and then nothing ever comes of it. And what was the point? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. why virtual reality is awesome and it is indeed functional. Mm -hmm. but it's been falling flat. It's been, what, like, if you think about, think about the last technology that's actually mattered to you. What is the technology that has actually made a difference in your life and has impacted your life? And what, this is what matters. This is, and that might actually look different based on context. Oh, The no. technology that, made a difference at work is different than what made a difference at home is different than what made a difference when you're at the community garden and trying to um, share who's going to be watering the next plant round. And a lot of people don't understand the technology that exists to help them in the problem space that they're living. So that is the value of the library right now, is if we understand the problems people are facing and we are able to break that out into segments and be able to connect people with technology that can help in their everyday life, that's invaluable. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is, and another thing is building a menu of technology that's available and just having that available for yourself and library staff. So you need to actually understand a little bit about who people are and what makes them tick, then a little bit about the technology groupings, and then a little bit about how to actually incorporate this into their lives. So how do you actually find that out? That's why we're all here. The who is learning and why. There's a little blurb on user experience. I just talked about that. But these are some of the questions you wanna start asking people. So this little segment right here, instead of just asking, what technology do you care about? That's like ask, that's sending out a survey. That's like, if I sent out a survey and I asked you, do you need to know more about user experience design? You'd probably say, no, why do I care about that? <laughs> or, or if I say like, do you need to know about robotics? You're gonna be like, maybe, I don't know, but, and then you'll probably, you might check it off because you're, you're curious about it. And then the library says, 
um, 82% of our respondents said that they wanted to learn more about robotics. We're going to do a course on robotics. Then you do a course on robotics, nobody shows up. Because they didn't so, know what they were asking for. <laughs> yeah. So instead ask, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? Because what keeps you up at night are the problems. What keeps you up at night is I am trying to update my budget and my kids need to go on a field trip, but I don't know how I'm going to pay the expenses for it. Or I am about to retire, but I don't know how to um, make sure my retirement savings are intact. What keeps you up at night? And what are you worried about right now? What are your priorities in life right now? <clears throat> and just asking open-ended questions like, how are you feeling about a situation? How do you feel about work right now? How do you feel about your current relationship? Um, do you feel good about your education? Do you know what do you know what your next step is in life? And do you know, because people don't always know what to do next. That's why the library offers career exploration services is because people don't know what exists. So they, if they don't know what exists, they don't know that they want to do it. And so once people figure out what they want to do, how do you break that down into stages so that you can start learning it? And is it the library that's going to help with that or is it going to be a partner organization? And how are you going to help people understand the process of being able to figure out what they want to do, when, where, and why? Because we want to look at people as a whole person, not just as a tick mark as someone who just attended our latest event. And so these are just different phrasings that you can start using to start pulling this information out of people and start understanding what people are facing, what they need to do, and what they don't know. So what they don't know is where the library can help. Mm -hmm. And so this is what you want to ask, but the techniques are actually how you would do it. So this day in the life process is actually mapping through day by day by day to say, well, this is what you do when you wake up and this is what you then you get the kids ready for school. I don't have any kids. I'm just assuming that's what you do first. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Feed that's cats. what my brother does. Feed the, <laughs> feed the, feed the um, frog. Yeah. Yeah. That you're pet sitting, whichever work. <laughs> Optimus Prime. Got to keep him fed. <laughs> But so what do people actually, what is their day to day? And when you understand their day to day, that's like ridding yourself in the reality of life. And that's when you would start figuring out what time you're going to offer these different services. It's when you're going to dig in and say, um, and you're going to choose your format for how you're going to offer this. Because if you realize that people need to um, pick up their kids from school, then they go cook dinner, and you know that the library is a 15 to 20 minute drive away, and they only have a one hour block of time before they have to start the next thing, then the odds of them actually making it into the physical library location get lower and lower and lower as you look at the actual schedule. And when you realize what people are facing in the rest of their day, then you also realize that it's not necessarily the actual service that the library is offering that is wrong. It's not the content that's wrong. It's how it's delivered. Because you can fit an hour into the day more easily right before you go to bed than you would right after dinner. Like you wouldn't like at six or seven o'clock, you wouldn't have time to just duck out, go to the library, do an, an hour or two hour long workshop and come back. That's a disruption of your time. That's why higher education is changing right now. It's because not everyone can disrupt their entire lives and center their lives around schooling. You can't make money doing that. But 
and you can't support yourself and pay the bills while you're doing that. But if you're taking classes online when you can, then it's different. Mm -hmm. So what can actually be taught online, what can't? And when you understand this is part of knowing what people are facing on the day to day, but then the problem, like the problem prioritization is people have 99 problems, but what is foremost on their mind? What is keeping them awake? And part of the way that you can find that out is during writing groups. So writing groups, people, and if you know your reader advisors, then they know what people are reading. Then there is, there's a privacy component to that but you can also aggregate the information so that you can remove that privacy component to say what types and topics of books are people most interested in right now? What is on people's minds on a community level? And so if you pull that metric and if you start looking at writing groups and story and reading groups, book groups, discussions and say, I know we're, we just talked about this book a lot, but I just want to take five minutes to just find out, was state the project that you're working on just briefly and say, I want to find out what matters to you. I want to find out what you're facing in life so we can figure out the best way the, the library can help. And you'll probably find that people love to share their problems because they know that when they share a problem, they're that much closer to finding a solution. So if at the end of a writing workshop or at the end of a book discussion, you just ask that and start jotting down the answers and start figuring out what people actually need in an organic way, then you can start doing the UX research just over time doing the stuff that you already do. So at the end of a book group, knitting group, um, wherever people are already coming in, ask them. They're already thinking about it. And you can also do this in kind of a either community conversation or informal conversation. The community conversation, um, the American Library Association has a whole guidebook around it. Um, that is kind of the formal version of it where you bring people together, have like a little format of questions that you want to start asking. This is how you can uncover community-wide problems, but not just don't just uncover the problems people are facing, uncover the problems that people actually actively want to take action to solve. Because some of them are just problems that have been there forever and a day, and you either need a new way to solve it, you need new people looking at the problem, or you need to have a different approach. So these community conversation formats can help a lot with this. Um, I have all the resources that will actually guide you through doing this. I just, since I'm frog sitting right now, I can't remote into my computer workstation until I download the right program onto this computer. So that's why I haven't updated some of the resources that are available in here, but I do have them. Um, if you're curious about well, like the, you said this is a work in progress being developed as you're doing this yeah. these intro courses for us, uh, sessions for us here so that's okay i will grab the community conversation workbook just as a reference if you want to know what i was talking about and i will put this into the chat That is just one that I happen to have offhand. So there we go. And I do have, I have worksheets for this day in the life one. And I have a worksheet for the card sorting. And there's a ton of resources for the field studies and resources. If you already work in libraries and you've done some research, you might've already known these methods. But there's also some new ones that were specifically made for user experience design. And mm -hmm. these are in the Nielsen Normal Group, which is kind of one of the biggies in UX design. 
So if you want to learn more about these research techniques, and some of these I just made specifically for libraries, like the What's Your Story. As far as I know, I don't actually think UX designers actually do that. The reference interview is library specific. Question tracking is library specific. And to in some, the, car, the card sorting is rooted in UX design, but I adapted it for libraries. It's interesting so, that we've always done the reference interview and, and asking for you know stories and, and for advocacy and things. Probably didn't realize that that was what you were doing, researching you know these techniques for what people really want, which is you, which is user experience. <clears throat> you know what do they need to answer this reference question? What are they really asking for? We've been doing that already and didn't realize that skill can now translate into this bigger. Um, these other projects and things, any other trainings that you um, might want to do. And fun fact, just like a fun UX fact, the reason I chose these and formatted the way they are, um, it took a, probably a few years to do it, just learning the process, but I had to understand the everyday flow of life for the librarian. Then I chose UX research techniques that fit with the flow of life. Mm -hmm. What do you already do? How can you play off of this? Because a lot of the UX research techniques that are used in small businesses, they didn't always translate over. Oh, so yeah, they're not gonna. Design. Mm -hmm. And there's about 8 billion different research techniques. These are just what fit best with the flow. And oh, card sorting is the next one I was going to touch on. So card sorting helps people figure out what actually matters to them. So one of the biggest things that people have run into is when you ask people what their values are, they will either stare at you blankly or just say like honesty or something like that. But it's not something that a lot of people have always thought about. So instead of just openly asking what are your values and getting a blank stare or something that people made up on the fly, you can write down a series of values on either post-it notes or index cards. And to save space, you can cut an index card into like quarters just so you don't waste a bunch of cards. And ask people to review over and sort these values based on priority. And you can do that in phases. You can say, choose your top 20, choose your top 10, and now choose your top three to five. And then people start actively thinking about what actually matters. You can do that with values. You can do that with actual technology tools. You can say, we offer courses or materials or resources on these um, 20 different technology tools or we're thinking about doing these 20 different technology tools, try, ma try matching these over to what the problems are in your life, make a set of cards for problems, and then make a set of cards for technology tools and ask people to start playing matching. Or just ask your library staff to start playing matching. Because if you can't match a problem card with a technology card, then you're going to have a mismatch. You're going to be offering a technology tool that doesn't match any problem and no one's going to show up. Or it's going to go the way of VR and it's going to be really, really cool for a second and then it'll go to the wayside. By the way, VR can actually be really functional. Just a side note there. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are places using you have, you have things like the, the medical areas where you can see the inside of the heart and things like that. I get those. Oh, yeah. yeah, but it's few and far between, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, oh, sorry. At the moment. <laughs> yeah, all right. And that's the other thing is that you might introduce people to a new technology tool and they'll have a problem that they can match it to. So, possibilities. And there's also helping people prioritize their life goals based on card sorting. Because if you ask people to write out their, just brain dump all their problems onto a set of cards and then say, okay, now organize these problems. 
the human brain can only focus on maybe about four tasks at a time. Which ones would you want to prioritize so that you don't go crazy? And because half the reason that people don't make any progress in what they're working on is because they're trying to focus on too many different things at a time. So they start working on little fragments of each different problem, but they never actually solve any of them because they never made any organized progress toward any one goal. And so this question, so this card sorting can actually help prioritize both the library staff and user patrons themselves. And sorry if I go back and forth between users, patrons, and customers, because each different organization that I pulled from uses different terminology. There's no consistency. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all just can't decide. Right. Yeah. And question tracking, some libraries already do, and some libraries are looking at different ways to do it. But who is going into the library itself? Who is calling in? Who is emailing in? And what are what do they need? What are they actually asking? And is what they asked what they actually needed? Or was it required for the reference interview to be able to winnow out what they actually needed? And because if I when I worked in libraries, that was half of what I did. It was people came in with a question, but then when you start asking for additional information, you realize that their question is maybe not what they actually needed. Um, they may have come in asking for, um, they want to learn more about um, the American Job Center. And then, so they asked about that, but then you find out that they actually need unemployment forms and assistance with a resume and cover letter. And maybe the American Job Center is the best place for that, but maybe not. And maybe based on what they are trying to accomplish, and once you help them articulate and write down their actual goal and start breaking it down into subtopics, they realize, oh, maybe that's not actually what I needed. Thanks. And that's kind of, if you've ever worked behind the ref desk at a library, you probably run into that already. That's a reference interview. Yep, that's that skill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we know but you it, really don't want what you say, but let's get there. <laughs> right? Yeah. And when dealing with tech, you run into this a lot just because people don't always understand what the tech is available. So when you start putting together the menu of technology and just having that on hand for yourself and library staff, and that menu that you start building up is how you're going to help people play matching and say, there, because there's a bunch of different routes that people are going to come into the library to start presenting the problem that they're trying to solve. But you need to help them format it as a solvable, actionable problem. And I think there was a session that I went to recently. It was called Design Your Life. And Design Your Life came out of Stanford. It was a TED Talk. And he talked about find the actionable problem versus the gravity problem. The gravity mm -hmm. problem is the problem that you've been working on forever and a day. It's the one that your friend comes in and complains about 8 million and one times, but they never do anything about it. And it's either because they can't find a solution or because they can't get motivation to do it and they're just never going to do it. And there's your gravity problem. Avoid the gravity problem, otherwise you're going to get pulled down. And I'll actually put in the link to that TED Talk too, just because it was delightful. <laughs> and I will open this on the other screen so that... There it is. Five steps to designing the life you want. And I will put that into the chat. Really good talk. There's also a book about it. Check your local library. 
And so really what libraries are looking at is this is a thing they do already, but how can you format it to help best with the de guiding design when you're building library services? So the most common way that libraries are doing this right now is by, is by just building metrics. But another way that you can do it is by starting to pull out keywords within emails and pull out keywords within conversations and start building a visual map of those keywords. When you build a visual map of those keywords, then you'll actually see which blob is bigger. And the colors in that visual map will start to like pull information out better. So convert question matching metrics into a data visualization and you'll be able to interpret and use the information more effectively. Um, there's free data visualization tools that are out there. If you Google, actually Google makes them, so you actually have to Google Google. Um, <laughs> Google Google data visualization. <laughs> and there's also word mapping. So if you turn question tracking into a word map, um, a lot of the tools that are out there, the words that are most important will turn bigger. So the more people who say that term, the word just turns giant. So you know just visually, and also word map library, it just goes together. And, oh, I'm actually gonna jot this down here. And this is kind of a funny side note, but on the on the second monitor that I have, I have um, the picture of Krista and me on the webcam and the video that I just pulled up, the guy was like, had his arms outstretched. Mm -hmm. So it looked like Krista's head would just randomly plopped onto his body. <laughs> that was kind of awesome. <laughs> it was lined up perfectly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so I'll also go down into, so these are the resources that you use to pull out the information from people, but now you need to start formatting it in a way that you can actually use with library staff or on your own if you are a solo librarian or on your own in this. So that is the guide design overview, is how you just pulled all this information from about five or two, three, four, five different resources you might have collected it in one week, in one month, or over a course of a year, and now you need to pull it together so it's usable. So this is the guide the design overview, is how do you actually use this stuff? So I categorize this into two different segments. One is the resources that will guide the design process itself. These are the resources that help ground you into the whole human who people are, what are they motivated by, what are they focused on, what makes them do the things they do. That is the guiding design. And then the narrowing focus is how do you actually, how do you map this stuff for library staff? How do you brainstorm it? How do you organize the information so that everyone on your library staff actually understands what people are facing and that you have more eyes who are contributing to a solution? How do you format this so that people understand the problem and can help? So the guiding design resources, um, one of the most common ones that's used in user experience design and product design is the persona. So I also have a worksheet for this. Again, frog sitting, haven't gotten it on there yet, but the persona is, it's like a little sheet and I'll pull up Oh, I can't pull up my Canva because I can't remember the password because it's stored on my local computer. Um, <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. I'll actually, if I open up Canva, I'm going to open up his Canva. No, let's not do that. That's okay. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So it's basically, what I can do is pull up the UX sheet. So... You can actually oh, yeah. I'll just mention to everybody who's here, um, we are getting close to 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Um, we do not cut things off just because we hit 11 a.m. Um, if you have any questions, type in the questions section. If you want me to unmute you, um, let me know and we can do that. Um, and you can ask your question or um, make your comment that way. 
Uh, we'll stay on as long as uh, Amanda needs to finish things up and if people do have any questions. All right, so I will drag this over. Oh, I hit a shortcut key on his, he has an ergonomic mouse and I keep hitting the back button <laughs> that's on the side of the mouse. And that is what I just did. So I will open this again. There we go. So these are just templates that you can fill in. You can download them. Basically, if you look up a persona of a, a template of a persona, there's a bunch of different flavors of it, but it has the same general categories. So what are people actually facing? What motivates them to do the things they do? Who are the people surrounding them that are helping influence and impact their decisions? Uh, what are their life goals? What are they actually prioritizing? What are they taking action on right now? And what's kind of generally taking a backseat? What are the barriers that are, that are getting in the way of their actual goals? I added a few more segments into my into the one that I actually customized. Um, I added a text segment just because I wanted to find out which technology people already use because if you already use a technology just start adapting that technology to suit the new goal that you have and kind of a summary segment and the target demographic that they would fall into in your specific library every library tends to categorize and use different terminology for how they categorize people but so back here I'll just feature a couple other one of these. Um, when you challenge people to tell another person's story, that's kind of the ultimate in empathy and the ultimate in getting into someone else's shoes. So if you write someone else's story and then trade stories and figure out, did I actually succeed in getting into another person's shoes? And there's also, this is another one that isn't really UX related, but it's just library related, is building an inspiration board or a collage that has different images, art, books, quotes, keywords that are just related to that demographic that when you look at it, that's a, they say, this is who this person is, this is who they're all about. And it'll ground you into making decisions based on who people actually are. And it's very visualizing your brainstorming. That's a good idea. Yeah. So you remember. And then it and can be modified as you change and learn new things. Exactly. And it can be done virtually or in a physical board. You can get a piece of poster board and put it together in the actual library. Or you can use like Google Docs or use any shared document board. Canva you can use and just put it together like that. And so I'll just touch on a couple of the tools that you can use to narrow focus and start the brainstorming process. Um, the quickest, easiest, cheapest way is using the post-it brainstorming. It's basically putting together a general topic on, the, on a post-it and then start branching out using other post-its related topics. Once you've brain dumped everything as a individual or a group, organize it and start clustering it and find out what matches. A similar technique is mind mapping. Mind mapping, there's another TED talk that actually shows how to do it. There's other books that do it. There's about 8 million different PhDs that do it. And it's just people that are brain dumping all of what they're thinking into a piece of paper. Um, Miro is a free tool that you can use to do this digitally. It's M-I-R-O and it has a mind mapping template that's already made up that you can just fill in. But you start off with a topic and instead of post-its, you just start building physical branches. These physical branches can then be connected and reconnected so that you can start uncovering patterns in the um, category that you're talking about. 
So you might start off with a demographic and the branches might be the problems that people are facing, or you might start off with an actual problem and find out the demographics or the sub problems that are within that problem. So there's different routes that you can do this, but the tools are free. And asset mapping is um, figuring out what you're good at and why, because you might be choosing what to focus on based on what library staff and available resources are focused on, because it's gonna be kind of hard to actually do any of this if you don't have people that are willing to try it in the actual library. So it is 11.03. I kind of whipped through the last little bit of it, but we got there. Okay. And so I will be reformatting this to make it more UX friendly. Uh, right now, this is in a list format, but if you go up here, um, there is a, if you, you can actually see a visual difference between the card format and the list format. Mm -hmm. And you can see like even just looking, comparing the two side by side, your brain processes the information differently in yeah. the clean card format than it does in the list format. <laughs> to me, it feels less overwhelming in yeah. the card. They're like yeah. individual concepts and I can focus on each one rather than, oh, this long list and which thing do I want, do I have to look at next? Yeah. It makes and it uh, blocks of text too. Um, instead of the blocks of text are yeah. okay, but you can add a picture on the right hand side to break up that block of text. And then the brain is able to process the information more easily and group and categorize and remember the information more easily. And so that's why textbooks do what they do a lot is they will add a little related picture on the right hand side and then add more white space and then add a color blocking system so that different concepts are color blocked out yeah. so that you can visually block off that design. And so that is why in here, it's more visually spaced out for this digital literacy guidebook and the concepts are actually blocked out. And so that is just switching it out that way this is the almost the exact same layout as I did with this, but it uses color blocking. And just that little thing takes like 30 seconds, but it makes a big difference. Admittedly, I could use more pictures on this, but nah, we'll get there. So that is the evolution of design. Uh, were there any questions about what was covered? It was a lot, but yeah. but like I said, you know, this is just a, a start. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type in the question section. Nobody typed anything during the session, but that's okay. Um, as I said, there's a lot. Um, okay. Um, Mo, I see you raised your hand. Do you have a, I've unmuted you. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. No problem. Probably tap the button or something. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, I will sip my yep. coffee then. Yeah, well, if nobody has any questions, that's okay. Um, this is, you know, as we said, this is the first of our four-part series on this teaching technology and the beginning of this course, too. So, um, an intro to the beginning of this course. Does that sound right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is just to get you started. Does anybody, um, oh, we just have some thanks. Mo says, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the session. Doesn't look like anybody has any desperate questions they need answered right now. They never do. Yeah, that's all right. Well, sometimes, <laughs> like I said, it's a lot to, to take in right now, but that's why we've got, you know, this is just a start, so. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to wrap up with this before I uh, go on and talk about what we're going to be doing next? That's oh, oh, 11.08. They've heard uh, enough. Okay. It's 11.08. They've heard enough. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen here. Go.
Yeah, all right. So um, as we said, this is part one of this four-part series. Um, the other sessions will be coming up over the next couple of months. They're um, every other week-ish with other things in between. Um, so and as, as it says here, the course content will become available at the start of each of these intro sessions. So right now I've got the overview and as Amanda says, she's going to with frog sitting, um, working on that, <laughs> getting that yeah. updated. Um, so we can have uh, the frog have do a little cameo. <laughs> They're nocturnal, so I don't know if you'd uh, like that little red-eyed yeah. tree frog. Let's not do that. No, let's not wake them up. Okay. <laughs> um, that, and you can go ahead and register for the um, other three sessions coming up, session two, three, and four. They're up there and posted. We've got links to them. Um, session two for this teaching tech is on June 16th. Session three, finding partners and preparing staff is on July 14th. And the last session, marketing and follow-up, will be on uh, July 28th. So if you want to uh, go ahead and register for the full series of all of those and then um, to work on the course work. Um, as it says here, um, the course, anyone can take this course. This is not something specific to Nebraska, which is great. Um, the course with materials available, um, but of course we will see e-credit for our Nebraska library certification. We can only issue that to our Nebraska libraries. Um, if you do have a, a uh, where you earn CE credits for anything at your, in your state, you just have to reach out to your CE granting person and um, show them this course, uh, the actual coursework, and see um, if they would, how you would get CE from your own um, state. Um, there's a link here, which we did share into the chat, but it's a link here right into the um, preview that uh, Amanda was showing. So. Um, you've got that right there. And as each of the other sessions come live, they will be added to their session descriptions as well. Um, so that is wrapping up for today's show and some intro about our sessions. Here you can see the next couple of months of our scheduled uh, sessions and Encompass Live. Um, as I, uh, we do have our archives right here, I mentioned that. If you click on right underneath our upcoming shows, the link to our archives this is all of our archives. The most recent ones will be at the top of the page. So today's show will be right here at the top. Should be done as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me by the end of the day tomorrow at the very latest. And I'll post it here um, with a link to Amanda's slides. Um, everyone who attended today and registered for today's com session will get an email from me. Um, letting you know that it's available. Um, we also have a Facebook page. You can see that it's been linked in many of our pages. Um, we do post things over there as well. So if you do like to use Facebook, here's a reminder for today's show, info about our speakers, um, when last week's recording was made available. Um, so if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We also post to other social media, Twitter, Instagram, that we have um, using the hashtag and comp live little abbreviation so if you want to follow um, what we are doing on other various social media you can use that hashtag um, or you can just keep an eye on our website uh, while we're here in the archives I will just mention there is a search feature here so you can search our archives for any topics you might be interested in see if we've done a show on it you can search the full archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something really recent um, that is because this is the full archives for Encompass Live I'm not gonna scroll all the way to the bottom but just to show you um, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009 so we have over 10 years 10 11 12 years worth of recordings here so um, just pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything that you watch on here uh, so you know that that was done at that time. Um, information may change over time. Some resources um, may become outdated or, um, or um, some things will stand the test of time, like some reading lists maybe and other things, but um, some things may not. Um, links may no longer work anymore. Resources may change drastically from when we had original show. Um, some websites are, are um, services may no longer exist at all. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date when you do watch any of our archives. Um, we will, um, as long as we have a place to keep them, but we will always keep all these up. We're librarians, that's one of the things we do is um, host archive and historical documents. And that's something we'll always have our full archives here for everyone to watch if you need, if you want to. Let's go back to our main page here. So that will wrap up today. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about mental maintenance. 
Uh, Jeremy Baum, who's from uh, the Lincoln, Louisiana Parish Library, is going to talk about, to us about mindfulness and self-care, um, how, how we can do that as uh, in our lives, and that may also help um, something we can work, um, share out to our patrons as well. So uh, please do sign up for that show or any of our other upcoming shows we have, definitely. Um, if you want to keep going with this series, our other part two, three, and four, get registered for those as well. Other than that, that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Thank you, Amanda. And um, what is it, Optimus the Frog? Optimus Prime. <laughs> yes, for <laughs> agreeing to let Amanda join us here today. Hopefully we didn't disturb his sleep time. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.